This is the Tribe Mastermind, where we talk business, purpose, and passion with your hosts, Jordan Muela and Steve Welty. If you're ready to shift into a bigger future, then this is the show for you. So plug in, buckle up, and get ready to be. But man, it's been a while. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. I'm like... <laughs> It's been a minute, man. Some things are different, but most things are still the same. Yeah, I think our last show was October 31st. I mm-hmm. it out, so it took a little time over the holidays. Give me an update, man. What's, what are the key things that's happening? So I really enjoyed taking some time off for the holidays. It wasn't as much as I thought. Didn't do as much planning as I thought, but I still did a lot. I did my 2019 retrospection. I did my 2018. I reread my 2018 retrospective. That was helpful. Some definitely some recurring themes. Um, I'm excited about 2020. I mean, to be honest, I just got done with like a um, 10 day working stretch, six of which were the rent, with the rent scale crew. I got a baby coming. Um, so I got a lot going on, but all in all, I'm really happy with the direction and I'm happy with some, some shifts and some change and flexing some good courage related muscles. So um, all in all, I'm in a good spot. How about you? Good, man. That's awesome. I'd like to go back and check out 2018 retrospective. Uh, I checked out 19. Uh, it was a good year. Did you do uh, a one word for the year? I did not. No. How about you? I, I can't remember where that came up. I think it was like broker owner or something, but someone hit me with that question. What's your one word? And I looked back and my one word for the year was simple. <laughs> and then I was like, I don't know how well I did at keeping it simple, but um, I think, uh, yeah, it was just interesting to go back. And so, uh, so yeah, just a great year overall. Holidays were really sweet. Miles is growing up. He's just opened the door now. So now he can open doors. So now it's time to move my office. Uh, It's problems. But man, I'm excited for you. Uh, When's Sarah due? 15th. Awesome, man. Uh, That actually, I've dealt with that. What are you going to do about your office? Because um, to me, home officing was great right up until a certain (laughs) age where it like completely changed. Right. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like I have a little office in my garage, which I might move to, um, or I might get a little space somewhere. I don't know. We'll have to see, but. (laughs) Or, or God forbid you can actually work in your actual office. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Well, actually there's no more room for me there now. So. Okay. Good to know. know, I think, uh, have to figure something else out, but, but no, I've never felt, uh, this excited for a year and, I don't think like I'm super pumped for this year. Like I've been diving back into fundamentals. Like I've been really interested in uh, like going back to the fundamentals and like rebuilding the business, rebuilding kind of like my personal life from just like, like the fundamentals. And so I went back to Jim Rohn, who's like the fundamentals guy. And Mm -hmm. like, there's just like these, these things that I think we kind of figure out and where we go, okay, we know that. And then we spend all of our time, trying to find this tactical mm. stuff like mm. and um so i'm like going back to some of the fundamentals and i'm like whoa i'm missing that didn't do that didn't do that so this year like just to give you an example um from the business end like what is our mission what is our vision what is our purpose what um what defines an a player like how do you make the team how do you you know like that was one big thing i i'm pushing this year is you know we we have to re-raise our level of expectation of of our team members. And so I defined what an A player is and I took the test and I scored an 88. And so I'm like, I'm not even an A player. Like I have to raise the bar on myself. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean like we have to work harder. Or we have to like stay longer. It's just like, it's the characteristics of like being self-disciplined, self-motivated, um, you know, working on the business, um, picking other people up, calling out, you know, behavior and other people like to them when it is out of alignment, just things like that. Um, I got really kicked up with that with uh, Darren Hardy's conference I went to because he was like person after person, Steve Jobs, like Ray Dalio, like all these people just like the the key to success for them was culture and the people, Mm. right? Mm. But it's funny, like, I've looked, uh, I've asked around NARPM a little bit and there's, there's a certain crowds that disagree with that, that think like culture or people 
like, well, people, I think is less important. Maybe there's, maybe there's a distinction between the two, but anyway, I'm going full in on that. And I'm really excited because I've already seen big progress out of the team. Um, people stepping up. So the, here's how I relate to this. The extent to which I'm invested in culture is the extent to which I have clarity on the fact that it is inescapable and it just is what you do. Like, it's not like an extra meta thing. Like it's just what's happening the decisions that are being made. I am starting to see some results, some cultural related results where core values are being used by team members to make, to shortcut decisions and to make decisions without asking. And they're the right decisions. And that's incredibly exciting to me. It's not universal across all organizations, but yeah, that really resonates with me. And uh, I love the idea of going back to the fundamentals. I used to feel bad that I would hear something and I'd be so motivated and inspired and then I would forget it and relearn it. But now I'm just realizing that's just the natural cycle of, <laughs> of life. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Rinse and repeat. Um, it's like 2.0. It's like uh, kind of trying to reinvent uh, myself and it just like the little things too. Like how you do anything is how you do everything. Looking at myself, like where am I not leading by example? Um, you know, where, you know, where can I improve? Where am I asking someone to do something that I'm not really doing? And mm. so I built, um, I built quite a lengthy scorecard for each. Well, I didn't build it. Like we built it as a team for each position. And we got extremely clear on the mission for the role, the three results you own, the three to five vital functions. Like what, you know, what are the key functions of your role? What are the key attributes of each person? So like there's, we, we, we picked out, um, I think nine key attributes, self-motivated, self-disciplined, honest, um, you know, helpful problem solver, empathetic, adaptable, resourceful attention to detail. Now, a lot of that stuff might seem kind of like squishy and like, well, like what, you know, like, I don't know, how's that going to move the needle, but you'd be surprised. Even when you, I go down this personally, I found two areas where I'm like, it's either a yes, a yes, no, or a no. And I was yes, no, meaning like I'm, you know, 50% of the time I'm in it, 50% I'm not. So I found uh, ways to improve there. And just being really clear on what we expect of everyone. Um, and then the behaviors of the A player, about 10 of those. Um, and this isn't something, you know, we're constantly going over with the team, but like at our quarterly reviews we just did, we went over this. It takes about an hour. And uh, man, people really liked it. Like people like clarity. People like to see where they're falling short. And um, I'm just really pumped about it. So it, where is your mind at in terms of the actual usage or application about this? Is it about getting the new right people on the bus, uh, having the courage and willingness to get people that need to get off off or coaching and improvement in for folks that are already in a good spot. Yeah. Coaching and improvement definitely for, co for folks that are already in a good spot. Um, identifying people that aren't going to make it, you know what I mean? And giving them, giving an easy, like I've heard the saying, if you fire someone and they're surprised, you've failed as a leader. You know, like I want to have very clear, like as clear as possible guidelines. So that way, if someone's not the right fit um, and I don't have anyone like in particular on my team, but just like, you know, to have this moving forward, very, very cut and dry. And then, uh, you know, just raising the standard, you know, like just giving the raw, raw speech, you know, things are changing. The punch that knocks you out, the one you didn't see coming, you know, there's, this job's not guaranteed this you know, position this, you know, company, you know, we've got people coming for us. We've got to really hunker down and, and add value. And um, we're going to really rebuild this thing from the ground up. And that starts with like, because I think even good to great talks about it. It's like his whole thing is disciplined people with disciplined thought, disciplined action. Like you don't need all these other like uh, systems you have to build to, to monitor people or systems to make things fail safe. Like go, are become unnecessary when you have the disciplined people, right? So I don't know. That's kind of where I've been excited about lately. <laughs> Here's an interesting question that I asked somebody the other day in the context of a coaching call. And it can be summed up as if you knew that there was a 10 X financial opportunity, and I don't think I asked it quite 10 X. I think it was like a lower bar than that. But if you knew there was a 10 X financial opportunity that was purely transactional, it says Bitcoin, right? It's just like you in a room with a computer. Right. 
would you be willing to uh, flush the existing priorities and concerns in order to jump on that if it was if it was guaranteed? How do you think about and relate to that question? So if I was able to jump into something else and it would give me a, a big, a way bigger return, um, would I not, do it? But non, the key here is non-relational. There's no, there's no, there's no juice. There's no operation. It's just a, it's a server room. <laughs> would I do it? Um, well, yeah, I guess as an ancillary business, but like, would it require all my time? Yeah. Focus. Oh, oh it require all my focus. Um, man, I don't know. Probably not. No, I, I, I get a lot out of working with people. Mm -hmm. That was this, that was this person's answer. And this, it was really stimulating for me to reflect back on it because I think that's like a great moment of honesty for entrepreneurs is to recognize that so much of what we get is the juice and the experience. And it's what keeps us in the game, even though for most entrepreneurs, they'd be better off working a high paid job in middle management. That reminds me of, uh, did you see Clint's question he posed? Oh, I love that. How, uh, how can you achieve your 10 year plan in six months? Yeah, that was, that was great. I chuckled at the first response too. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? That was funny. But, uh, but that reminds me, your question reminds me kind of of that because I did it and I was like, wow, it's actually probably possible, um, reasonably possible to do that. But like, it would require different things that I, I don't, not that I, it'd require things I don't want to do, like not necessarily the time, but just like, I don't know, like going into areas I'm not passionate about things like that. And so it's not about money is what that kind of tells me. Well, I don't think his question was like your 10 year financial goal, unless I'm not mistaken. So if the 10 year goal is to go, oh, that's really interesting. What is the 10 year goal? The 10 year goal for me, just talking out loud, 10 year goal would be a massive amount of being hell yes in all areas of my life, a massive amount of impact shift, stimulation, creating a bunch of joy and abundance for other people around me, 10 years or six months is kind of irrelevant. Um, yeah, that's funny. You said that I should ask him because sometimes we take questions differently. I totally went like, well, I, the only reason I even had, honestly, I didn't have a 10 year plan until, and I kind of still don't, I guess, but like a week ago, I just happened to be going through Jim Rohn again. And he talks about like doing, he has this cool exercise where it's like uh, just stream of consciousness, take 15 minutes and write down as many goals you can over the next one to 10 years and then stop and try to get about 50 and then number them, the ones that are going to take one year, three years, five years, or 10 years. And then number those down to like your top four in each category. So I just like happened to have some things and like a couple of them were, I think, monetary for 10 years and a couple were um, kind of like accomplishment, I guess, type things or things to do. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I, it, there's a lot more to it than the finance. That's for sure. Super random segue. When the Rensco crews out here, I did that. I did iFly, which is like indoor skydiving. You guys are crushing it on like the team building. We're dude, we're having a good time. But the reason I, I bring it. it up was when I was there, it was like really, really interesting to me. And I feel like I have this fantasy that I'm gonna experience some hobby that all of a sudden is gonna like grab my attention and that's gonna be <laughs> my new thing. And I don't know that it was quite there, but it was it was pretty close. Like it was really, really fascinating just being in this flying tube and all these like this is this is the, what would navigate your body like what i'm doing with my hand right here these micro movements yeah. this is what would like it was crazy so really? i've never done that it looks so fun yeah at first you feel like it's total chaos but then you kind of dial in all the little micro adjustments that allow you to actually navigate and it was really stimulating to me i would say that i still look to certain hobbies or exercises as a way to develop like that complete and total mindfulness and focus outside of work. So that's definitely something that is uh, I'm aware of in 2020 that I want to um, I want to identify as like a personal hobby that really allows me to disengage in a way that isn't forced. Yeah, man, I love that you're you're doing all that stuff um, with with the rent scale crew. Curious, what uh, 
did you and Jeremy decide like, Hey, we're going to like, let's make this fun and do like fun shit. Is it like, just like, Hey, like, is it just not, I don't know. It's, it's unique. And I admire it to like be going out and having fun like that when you guys meet up. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is like, it's shorthand culture because Jeremy and I are really on the same page. I didn't tell him what we were doing. I told him I was going to set the agenda and it was going to be awesome. And he was off in Italy having a great time with his girlfriend. And then he came back and we did it and it was amazing. Um, but alignment, like I didn't need to ask. And we just, it was kind of a given, we're going to have a great time and we're going to go to nice restaurants and we're going to celebrate performance, et cetera. So shorthand, I just, I love the efficiency of it, you know? Yeah. I love how you're going after that too. It's a cool opportunity, um, to try a bunch of different things and be intentional about it. And like, I don't know something that comes up for me is just like, what if, uh, you know, what if I had to do everything I want to do in the next like two years? Like what, what's interests me that I've never tried and just like start making a list and just start trying stuff or also being a yes person to like personal activities or fun. And then trying to find maybe like that one thing by tasting a lot of different things, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's one way to, to solve for it. I love kind of like the consistency that you've had of like coming back to things that are already working. We talked a little bit of offline, a little bit about meditation and where I'm at with that, still just being curious rather than committed in it. Um, but I admire the fact that you've like incrementally developed some game in that practice. I think Tim Ferriss refers it to the idea of a minimum viable dose. So like, have you done any activity enough to say it does or doesn't work? Or did you just dabble? And then you're like, oh, that doesn't work. We see it happening all the time in business, right? Like, oh, I tried pay-per-click. That doesn't work. I tried hiring a BDM. That doesn't work. I tried culture. That doesn't work. But it's like, did you do it enough to be able to falsify one way or the other? Yeah, that um, that app, Calm, have you heard of it? It's like a unicorn, I guess. It's like, Billy, yeah, like they're really? public or they went pu- like something crazy. Like, wow, it's uh, worth many billions of dollars, as far as I heard. And I was shocked because it's a meditation app and like people are using it like crazy, I guess. Um, and because the benefits are just like meditation is like a push the button thing. Like, I tell everyone, actually, I finally told my team, I'm like, I kind of have the secret. Like, I feel like it's my secret, like, superpower. Like, this is what I've been doing to like really help me. And I want, I don't know why I never talk about it. Like, I want you guys to know, like what this has really helped me. And I'm usually like forthwith with other stuff, like a book or read this or whatever. But, um, but no, man, I, I'm, I think it's, it's just been awesome. So it's been awesome. Uh, I mean, since we're talking about it, people are listening, the, the fruit, uh, well, I think where it came up was I articulated to you that as I have waded into mindfulness, it's had a little bit of heaviness because it has caused me to have this goal or this aspiration for a level of mental clarity that I can't always maintain. And so sometimes I can back and like beat myself up, up, beat myself up or be fantasizing about some kind of mental relief where I'm not thinking about work or mm-hmm. chores or errands or whatever. Right. And you articulated that like, you actually have kind of tasted some of that from meditation. Like what language would you put around describing that experience? Yeah. And it's, it's taken a while. I've probably been doing it religiously every day for five years plus now. Wow. Six years. Yeah. Wow. Like missing very few days. Like I'm talking pretty much every day and like only in the last six to eight months, <laughs> I've really experienced um, long gaps where my mind doesn't race during meditation as much. Like it's just like, it's just silent, not the whole time, but that's the thing is uh, when thoughts come in, they teach you to uh, just notice it and let it go. When you make the thought, Oh, you know, I'm thinking too much. That's just, you've created more ego. Like you can't like wrestle the ego down. All you can do is notice it and just um, let it go. And so kind of that, that space in between is, uh, just being conscious of being conscious. And, um, (laughs) it's, uh, it's, um, it's been, I don't know. I first started, uh, as a way to honor God. Like some people use meditation as, um, just to like, uh, not a, you know, nothing related to God, just to get peace of mind, I guess, which is totally cool. But, um, I did it more from reading the autobiography of a yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. And then I found out that was the only book that Steve Jobs ever had on his iPad. 
or, and like, he was big into that. And that was actually one of the things, I guess, when Steve Jobs got sick, he like went straight to Eastern medicine and cause he was big into that. But then he said like, before he died, he really regretted that. Like he should have went straight to like a, a doctor. So I know, I don't know. He was big into Eastern medicine and like the Beatles, like all these people that were groundbreaking people were, were, um, really into um, Indian culture as far as like meditation and stuff. So that always really interest, interested me and just a way to sit and honor God and focus, you know, focus on the point between the eyebrows and just kind of just to sit there and, and just honor God. Cause man, God's done a lot for me and this, you know, he's the ultimate creator and I consider myself a creator. And so I try to honor him and, and just slowly through that, uh, you know, it's just, it's just done so much. It's made me a very, from a very frantic, very spacey person to more present, more grounded. And, um, and yeah, man, it's just, it's been a trip. That's beautiful. I, I'm, I'm inspired hearing that. And even though I'm at present still, I have been in this place of up into this moment in this place of curious rather than committed to see, to be inspired by other people doing simple things. You know, it's like, it's one thing to be inspired by somebody that built a hundred million dollar company. Well, that's, that's great. But it's like to be inspired by somebody that in their personal conduct and personal calm, um, personal behavior and relationships has done something that like call something else out of you. I've, I've kind of just observed how that calmness of mind has impacted how I first experienced you in Puerto Vallarta at that mastermind. What was that? Was that probably four years ago now? Yeah, probably. Oh man, that's crazy. Yeah, I've seen some shift in you. So I think that's what maintains my interest and hopefully eventually will get me over the hump. Awesome, man. Excited for you. It uh but it also I read something recently and it was it was I wish you know how people ask you, what do you wish you could have told your like 18 year old self? I think I have a good answer for this. <laughs> so it does um uh, there's no universal secret to success or failure the recipe for success for one man will spell failure for another and that kind of comes up for me when we're talking about this um although i believe meditation universally is great for someone like it might not make sense for certain people you know what i mean like and how that resonates with me is I used to go from book to book and you know, the books, it's like, if you follow this book, you will make $1 million. If you do not do everything in this book, as I say, you will not make $1 million. Like I used to like, okay, so I have to like work my ass off and do this. Okay. No, but this book says I have to like not work as hard and spend more time being quiet. And then this book says, you know what I mean? And just jumping. And so I don't know where I've read that, but that was like a, a light bulb came on. And, and even Jim Rohn says it, um, that even in his own stuff, he's like, take the few things, like, don't take everything I say. Maybe it is from Jim Rohn. Cause he says, don't take everything I say and go apply it because the recipe for success for one man will spell failure for another. <laughs> that, uh, there's some richness in that. I definitely, I feel, and I see the temptation around having a silver bullet and a very simple set of facts. And I've very much seen the reward of applying myself cognitively beyond the point of where most people's stamina ends. And that nuance of one more question, yeah, just like one more question, one more level of depth and of probing. I feel like that's where all the good things come from. So yeah. I like that. I yeah. Like it. another example, like the Grant Cardones of the world, like, mm -hmm. I'm drawn to that in a weird way, but then like that will destroy me. Like if I, if I like, if I just start working all the time and just be consumed with like personal gain, not, not to say he's like a bad guy or anything, um, but just like the way I interpret what he says. And it's all a, a matter of perception. Like the way he interprets it makes perfect sense to him. And it like aligns with probably his like values and it's all makes sense. But like the way I interpret it, I just, I can't, it wouldn't work for me. It would destroy me. <laughs> you know, my coach told me at one point that it was possible to take perspective, like whatever I make up or however I perceive Grant Cardone, that I could distinguish between taking that on as like a, pet of, a pair of glasses and put it on as a, as a frame to try it and to see its use. And that was 
separate from me having to completely connect my identity to it. And that created some lightness. Like I can see aspects mm -hmm. of what Grant is doing and I have appreciation. It's interesting, stimulating, seems useful, but that doesn't mean that even in me saying that, somebody else is like, I can't believe you like Grant Cardone. I don't need to then be like, yeah, well, I'm going to defend him now. Like, you know, just keep right. some lightness. There's, all, all, there's a whole host of people and viewpoints that 10% of is amazing. But if I consume to the point or if I cannot disassociate my identity from the utility of it, then that's when it becomes destructive for me. Yeah, I love that. It, it reminds me of why it's so important. I think it's one of the four agreements is not to judge. Like, because the other day I was thinking about, so we've talked about this, like um, sometimes entrepreneurs, people can be like consumed with money and, oh, I'm going to go after this. And then like, we've talked about it and I hope it, at times, I hope it hasn't come off as like judgmental, but like, I think we've always clarified like, hey, if that lights you up and like, that's like, do you like, that's great. Um, but, uh, but like Jim Rohn was saying, uh, if you like, what's the why behind the goal? Like some people might want to make a hundred million because they want to give it away, like all of it away. Like, uh, Rockefeller, I guess, or, um, Carnegie had a, had a note they found in his desk that said the first half of my life is going to be spent accumulating wealth. The second half is going to be spent giving it all away. And so, um, or like, what if, um, he was, cause he challenges people that say, Oh, I don't need money. He's like, okay, well, what if you need, wouldn't you like to be able to pay for a life saving, life saving surgery for like a family member? Like if, if it, if the need came up, I guess. So I guess where I'm going with this is before we judge someone about like that person's a workaholic or that person is like, you never know like where their head's at. Like they could be doing it for a completely different reason. They could be, um, we just assign reasons because we try to make sense of the world, you know, with what, everything that's going on. But, uh, but you know, you never know where someone's heart is with, with the thing. And totally. so I might say like, Hey, I want to make a hundred million dollars. And someone might say that you're a psychopath. Like, don't, isn't that enough? It's like, well, I want to give half of it away or I want to, you know what I mean? So there's always, it's always a perception, the flavor you put on it, the glasses, right? Yeah, it's really hard to judge people effectively. It's really easy to judge people, but to judge people effectively requires a certain level of vulnerability and relational proximity that is the opposite of judging them. Like if I'm just going to like judge you harshly, I got to keep you at a distance. But the closer I allow you to get would be the necessary inputs for me to judge you at a level of accuracy that would that would be true. There's like this inherent tension there. Yeah. They say yeah. this is the idea that travel is fatal to to prejudice. It's it's just a lot harder to judge people harshly. Like once you've actually had them in your home and had a relationship. Right. Oh, I like that. I like that quote. <sighs> Give me one other thought. Let's talk one other thought that has created stress over the last few weeks. Um uh, what I've been dealing with just on this team and the relationship that I have in that company is that I am not a CEO. I don't have a, a title. I'm an owner, but I'm kind of like, you know, chief enthusiasm officer. So I roll up and we, it, it, it was a EOS annual. So Jeremy and I do two days of planning and then there's two days with the team. Mm -hmm. And after our two days of planning, we worked with financial model. We banged on it quite a bit. And then mid meeting the next day, I realized that there was a massive missing assumption that got close to cutting the model in half, the forecast in half. And in that moment, it's like, do I want to look like an idiot in front of the team and basically communicate that what we have just gone on and on about the annual goal and rallying the truth? Or do I uh, go with, with Jeremy? And the net of all of that, without getting into how to solve for it, feeling like, oh, this is, like, this, this is just stressful. And, and the, the thought from that is like, why is why is all of this so hard? Like, why is business so hard? Mm -hmm. um, just kind of like, you know, at, at working this long after doing this for 
over a decade, shouldn't there be the opportunity to just like take it easy and have it be going downhill, you know, get a check and be on a beach, et cetera. And all of that got resolved. But before I talk about how it got resolved, like that was a, that was a moment of stress for me. How about you? Yeah. Last, last couple of weeks, thought of stress. <sighs> yeah, man. Um, I still am, I feel like I was drowning in this type of stress and now I'm like pulling myself out of the, the water, like by my hands and, and knees onto the shore figuratively. And it is the goals of life and living in the world versus like, what the hell does it all mean? Like, you know, just like be here and do the things you love to do and serve mm -hmm. people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And now it's conflated with the third thing, which is like, maybe neither is the case. Maybe it's not about me. Maybe like, maybe it's what about, where does God come into play? Like where, do, like, like I've lost focus of everything I do, like should be an offering to God, like hmm. without getting too turning too many people off. Like I, I first qualify God as like what I, I think all religions are the same pathway to, to the same place. And I think, um, God can mean many things, but just like, uh, like in purpose driven life, um, it talks about like the purpose is to serve God. And, and, um, and so like anything you do, you know, do it as an offering to God. And that's been really helpful to me lately when trying to decide between the two, because if I'm like, or like trying to figure that out, it's like, no matter what I'm doing, just do it as an offering to God, like do this podcast with an open heart. Um, love Jordan, you know, like just be loving, be caring and just like give it up to God and just hopefully it adds some value to people. And, and that's helped me calm down a little bit and also take the, the focus off myself because something that's helped with that stressful thought is it's not about you. It's not about you. Like this isn't about you. And I, I think I, I talked about it on one of the shows, Clint pointed it out on one uh, back and forth on WhatsApp. He's like, I forget what it was, but he's like, dude, you're, you're like selfish. Kind of like it's, it's quit worrying about like yourself. Like it's not about you. And that was actually really profound and really needed to hear because I think it, we get caught up a lot and it's natural. We shouldn't beat ourselves up about it, but like, okay, what am I going to do to make myself happy? Do I do the business or do I, it's like, well, take your focus off yourself for five minutes. Like what, where does God come into play? Where does like your community or your family? And so I don't know, just like, I want to wrap all of that up in a nice tight bow. And like, I'm a simplifier. So I need like all of that to come together in like three to five bullet points that I can focus my life on. <laughs> and so that just kind of like, so I'm going through like the goals exercise with Roan and then I'm going to like look at that and then put that aside and be like, okay, well, if I got this, what does that mean? And then like, where does my family come into play? Where's my community? My God. So I don't know. I guess like the stressful thought has just been kind of unbalanced where, where I'm heading just like globally, Steve Welty. <laughs> I feel you. Purpose. The existential stuff. This, this is what we're yeah. talk, kind of talking about purpose, meaning the why it is really interesting. I've heard you say before, I've already won or yeah. I can't lose or the best yeah. is yet to come. I've heard you say all those things. Yeah. Um, and that's a belief that is not grounded in proof. Like, how do you prove those things? How do you prove anything? Right. Um, and that's something I get a lot of comfort from. And it's one of the, the points of alignment that I have with um, Jeremy. We were just talking about a ton. Given that I cannot prove X, Y, Z, and I cannot prove a lot of what I believe, I've just kind of, I'm, I'm very content to choose beliefs that history tells me are in alignment with the outcomes and the things that, I want. So even as, even as you say that, like I can feel some of that same anxiety. So to, to put it on a bumper sticker, what was to put it on a bumper sticker? What was the idea that gave you some relief in the midst of that chaos? The idea was, I guess on a bumper sticker would be, it's not about you, but that doesn't like inspire me. That's kind of like the slap in the face. So I would, I wouldn't want that on my car full time. <laughs> it would just be like, that's like, um, Another good, good sentence I found is like ordinary people 
seek the world, but those that are wise seek, seek the kingdom of God. And like that, I don't mean that in an evangelical sense, really. Like, I just mean, I'm very interested. I'm just, my personality loves being different. Like I, I love to figure out what everyone else is doing and being like, no, like that's not like, you gotta go this way. So like this fires me up. So like everyone's trying to figure out how to make their life great today, but like, that's a pretty red ocean. It's like, why don't you be happy with what you have? Give it up to God, give it up to like your, your, um, your state of being always being primary. So always making sure you're in a good, you're a good place or making sure you're in the right spot. And, uh, before you go out and try to get all these worldly things. So I don't know, man, it's just, it's just, it's a journey. I haven't figured it all out. It is a fascinating thought, man. I, I can either make more money or I can be content with less. Same outcome. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. a head trip. Oh, I mean, or you just change your perception of it and instead of like writing every day, I'm going to make a million dollars and then like ripping people's heads off to get in, just like grinding, grinding, grinding. Maybe it's just like, you know, I'm going to do everything I do more simply and do it like as an offering to God and just like, it's more present, being more present with everything you're doing. And maybe that aligns you with the intention of the universe and ultimately makes your actions 10 times more uh, impactful and meaningful because uh, that's kind of what excites me and sticks with me. And that's why I'm doing all this being work and all this like spiritual work. Besides that, I just naturally like it. It's like, man, when you look up at the stars at night, it's like, it's a trip and uh, there's something going on. And I feel like Steve Jobs and the Beatles and Oprah and these people like that, you know, the Pope, like all these people that they like Gandhi, like Martin Luther King Jr. Like they've tapped into something that has nothing to do with what we're aware of on a perceptual level. You know, it's, um, that being work. That I would sum up that being work as saying there is a way of being that is more satisfying, fulfilling, and rewarding. And I choose to believe that optimizing and focusing on the way of being will create the derivative things, i.e. the doing and the having, mm -hmm. that I would say that I want. But ultimately, even if it doesn't, that's the question. Like, would I, would I give up the being? Would I give up becoming the art of becoming the person that I want to be if it doesn't result in? the doing and the having? I don't think you would, if you, if you, I don't think it would work like that because if you really solved for the, the being part, I mean, it's ultimately not solved. I, I think ever it's always a work in progress, but I, I think you would think of it differently. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I agree. I mean, my assumption is that the having is derivative, but it really doesn't matter. Like if I'm being true to myself and I'm having integrity and I don't get to have a billion dollars, would I consider sacrificing that? No, I wouldn't. Right. So my purpose, my purpose statement um, that I feel really good about that came over the last 60 days and that can help kind of boil that all down to one like bumper sticker statement for me anyway, is like my purpose is to light up and, and help other people light up. Like, I think we all know things in our lives, activities, people, situation, like that give us energy and spark us and that take it away. And so the world doesn't need more like millionaires or billionaires necessarily. Like that's great. That's actually going to come as a derivative of this, but the world needs more people to light up and find like what lights them up because if you're lit up, you're like, a, you spread, you know, lightness through, through the world. Like you can help other people find their light. They see how you are living and they're like interested in it. And you're not an asshole on the road when someone cuts you off and like, you're just, it just spreads. So I think I'm interested to hear how that comes off for you. But for me, that, that really simplifies it and makes it easy. Like if this is giving me energy and this makes me light up and this is a hell yes, this is like what I'm meant to be doing. And that might be the universe's subtle way of guiding us towards where we are intended to go by that, that feeling. 
And that sounds to me like an offering to God. That sounds like a doing right by whatever you think it, whatever anybody hearing this thinks it means to be made in the image of God. What I internalize that as I was given something of beauty that is bigger than me. And I want to steward that. And I know, I know that to be true for me. Um, the resolution with what I talked about earlier and that, that thought process I was having that resulted in kind of wanting some rest was the realization that when I long for a static destination, a place of relief, what that's telling me is that there's something about the journey that I need to alter because there is no, there is no destination. Right. You know, having a hundred million dollars living on an island, that's not a destination. I still got to live with me. I still got to think my own thoughts and my ambition would, would likely screw that up. Hey, if you made a hundred million, can you make a million? There is no destination. So when I fantasize and I long for that, it informs that there are some adjustments that I need to make, in, make around how I'm operating the journey that will um, take me back to a place of, of peace and calm because the journey is it. Every day, waking up, living. If I'm not optimizing for that, if all of this is just a proxy to get somewhere else, this is a conversation we had in chat. I think you brought it up. If, I'm, if I have things that I'm doing that I don't want to be doing for the sake of getting something else, to me, that's just kind of a bad sign. And I've experienced before that removing those things, removing the unnecessary suffering, removing the martyrdom in many ways like unblocks and gets me to what I really wanted faster. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's uh it's like it, it's something that I heard growing up in my early years of entrepreneurship so much that meant basically nothing to me. You know what I mean? Enjoy the journey like F you like <laughs> I'm broke. Like and <laughs> <I'm trying. laughs> the, the, the reply is like to me, I was like, Oh, you're weak. <laughs> right. Right. But it was just one of those things that I would hear people say, and it would like just go in one ear out the other, but it's become more real for me, you know? And I think ultimately, yeah. Like when you're just starting out and you have like, you no, know, you can't even pay your rent. Like there's stresses there. So you, you get a little bit of stability. Um, But, uh, but yeah, like when the present moment becomes an obstacle, like, uh, like I'm taking a shower. So, and then I'm thinking about my commute, I'm washing the dishes and I'm thinking about the argument. Like when it's just like a, Oh, I got to finish this. So I try to be aware of that. Anytime I'm like trying to finish something to like get somewhere else, like (laughs) it's like, it's insanity because this is all we've ever really had, all we ever really have. And um, the destination, I'm big on that. It's like, it won't make you any happier. And so, um, you know, doing things because you enjoy them. Like, like uh, with my music, I did a post about this a while ago. I don't know if you saw, but it was like, um, someone had challenged me about like, oh, like, you know, you're almost 40 and like you're doing music. Like, <laughs> that I said, uh, I put like a video out. I was like, you know, if you like what you do and it gives you joy and maybe it never amounts to anything in the eyes of the world, like you enjoyed yourself while you did it. Like what is there to regret? Like, you know, and so that comes down to the journey part of life. I could see a lot of regret saying, man, I I destroyed my relationships, my health, and my mental well-being for the last six years. And I didn't even get what I wanted (laughs) or, or, man, I actually did what I enjoyed. Like, what is there to regret? Um, So success is always available to us in this moment by just honoring the moment. And it's how you do the thing, um, not what you do. So I love it. Beautiful. That's a great place to end it, man. Stop chasing. Stop chasing the rabbit. Don't be like the greyhound chasing that rabbit going around (laughs) the track. Yeah, man. Love it. Well, cool, man. It's good to connect. Uh, Looking forward to uh, this new year and all the exciting things, man. I'm looking forward to staying in this conversation with you and kind of watching the journey. And hopefully, um, hopefully, I'll see you in person. What are you What are you doing in terms of travel? Are you going to make a rare appearance at a NARP event this year? Is it a maybe? <laughs> man, maybe we'll see uh, PM Grow maybe this year or whatever. But uh, but yeah, we'll pick one or two and hopefully see you out there. 
All right. Sounds good. Until next time. See you guys on the flip side. Peace. Did you enjoy this episode? Please share it with a friend and leave a review on iTunes. If you'd like to find out more about joining the tribe, go to tribemastermind.com to understand why the best and brightest mastermind with us.